Yeah, I'm not sure, but I, it's, I think it's a good topic. Hello, BookTube. Well, as you can see, I'm here with a guest. This is my friend, Zach, from the uh, the Brattle Bookshop in Boston. Care to say hi to my hi, BookTube friends? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Hello, BookTube. You are ensconced in a pile of books because you are filming from the Brattle Bookshop, right? <laughs> Yeah, several, several piles of books. And the Brattle the is moment. an old used bookstore in downtown Boston. Downtown Boston. Crammed with books. Yeah. There's the basement, yes. which, the which is full of books that no one sees except you. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully someone sees them eventually. But uh, sometimes that eventually takes a while. The first and second floors of the shop, which are what people would associate with a used bookstore. Just over crammed bookshelves of everything imaginable, except romance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the battle does not sell. They do, they do not sell romance. Do not. That? Yeah. Well, you know, we kind of have, um, have stopped not selling romance for years. Um, it was one of the very few uh, types of book that we didn't buy uh, at all. And uh, we, we don't have a prohibition anymore. We don't have a section yet because we don't have enough but if we ever were able to buy enough to necessitate a section I, I think we should you know we we certainly would or I certainly would and then, rather than have such a conspicuous uh, objection I mean it's such a conspicuous exception now that it, that it really is and it it makes it I don't know how much sense it made 15 years ago or 16 years ago when I started um, but I, I think it's a it's a real detriment now because people are people do come in looking for romance novels. It is not the most not the kind of book in the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it really is. So I I'll have to inquire as to why why that uh, was put into place. I'm sure it was a good reason when it uh, when it went into place. Probably something due to convenience mm -hmm. or the inconvenience of those who would <laughs> who would browse for them. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's it's long out of date. But in addition to the the uh, romance scorning two stores <laughs> the floor, there's also the third the third floor where I believe you are now. No, I'm actually in the basement. You're in the basement. But, okay. But I'm in the the room of the basement where uh, we do most of our research and cataloging, which and those are the books that go into the rare book. Room on the and the, that's, the third floor is rare and collectible books, first edition, yes. that sort of thing. That's right. Yeah, so you can see this is after we unpack them from boxes, or sometimes we just bring the whole box uh, in here. They usually end up in here, so we can research them, collate them, price them, and then they're for sale up on the third floor. And I, there in a, so to just to orient. Our, our listeners, just in case they're coming to this cold or future listeners mm -hmm. who don't know. In addition to all of that, that is not the whole spectrum of the brattle. There's one more part, which is the, the sale lot outside where That's right. things are tagged and put out in the elements. Yes, definitely the most visible um, uh, part of the shop. We have, oh God, I never even thought to, to count, but thousands and thousands of books out there at at a dollar three and five dollars. Right. Um, essentially, it could it could be a parking lot, but uh, we built um, uh, bookshelves into the walls and uh, have thirty some odd book carts that we roll out every day and, and roll back into the shop every night. But during so business that's hours, the whole they of the book. spectrum. If you go to the Brattle, it's entirely possible that you could find a really good book good in both senses of the word great condition mm -hmm. great appearance yeah. and also suiting all your reading needs for a dollar yes and it's also possible that you could spend ten thousand dollars if you wanted to on yes. a single book uh, absolutely depending on where in the shop you go mm -hmm. but the question that we're going to bat around today like and by and by the way at the moment i assure i assure you you could spend both one dollar and twelve thousand five hundred dollars on different versions of the same text. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Oh no! Do I want to know what it is? Uh, well, I, it might be fun to guess, but you don't need to. Know. 
we could we could leave that as a little bit of a mystery. Oh, I could easily come up with a handful of possible yeah, just plenty. by browsing the, the sale lot outdoors. Yep. You see things that I know I don't know much, but I know that some of the things out, so out outdoors that the techs have had collectible editions. Yep, absolutely. I think that's fascinating that you can go that whole range at the same store. There are plenty of bookstores that will only do your third floor. They won't yeah, and, do anything else. And and really, it, when you say stores, that number is is uh, is very small because most of the uh, the booksellers who specialize in rare antiquarian and, and collectible books don't have a physical retail location anymore. Mm -hmm. um, the vast majority of people work from work from an office. Some work from home, but they don't have what you would think of as an open shop. And yet, when we're talking about that huge spectrum, a dollar to $12,000, the people who buy those books are accumulating a library. Yeah. So uh, in what right. sense does the organization of the Brattle, let's leave aside the, well, actually, yeah, no, let's not leave out the sale lot. Let's, let's accumulate the sale lot with the first and second floors. Do the first and second floors, the implicit assumptions of the first and second floor of the shop, do they look at a different kind of book person than the third floor? Would both those people uh, say that they are collecting books? I, I would think I, I would think most um, visitors to, you know, most people who shop in, in either or both areas, I think they would both, most of them consider themselves to be book collectors and uh and i i probably agree with them um book collectors or book accumulators well see i tend to i tend to take a pretty inclusive view of the idea of of collecting i do know people who who uh tend to restrict their definition much more narrowly than than i do um but we can sort of talk about um, how people restrict that definition, you know, the, uh, between just sort of accumulating books and, col and a collection of books or, or anything else. Um, I've known people like that, so, people who, were, who have been customers of the Brattle in decades gone by, mm -hmm. who would say, if we were looking at, at, like, for instance, the sale lot or the whole of the shop, they would say, oh, I want yeah. this book. And they would also say, I want this for my collection. And they would be talking about two separate parts of their house. Two, two, se two separate things. And I'm, I'm one of those people too. Are you indeed? Um, I, defi I, I definitely uh, have, th think of uh, my, my collection or I, I have a couple different collections of books um, and books that I just sort of have to read as, as, sort, as different things. Um, they're, they're definitely in, in different categories. For and in the, in the stereotypical definition of collector, it would be mm -hmm. the latter, right? The, the stereotypical definition would be uh, you're a book collector if you never actually touch or open the books in your life. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing that a book collector would do was read a book. In is book. read a book. Although I think that's, um, that, that's a little bit more of a uh, caricature than than it needs to be. There are certainly people like that, but I don't think that's part of the definition. Oh, but is it a caricature? I mean, honestly, I think, I think if somebody has a first I, edition of the first edition of Leaves of Grass, they're not going to read it. They, I, they might not. Oh, but, oh, have but you ever known an example people, where someone did that? I'll, I'll, be, I'll be perfectly honest with you. The, some of the more most rare or valuable books that I have in my collection, I will look at from time to time um, and, and handle. They're not just something, you know, on, on a shelf to be admired from, from a distance. Now, certainly some collectors are like that, but I would venture a guess that most aren't, even if it's not the copy that they're going to take out and read when they want to reread a text, they might take it out from time to time and flip through to a passage or two, or just look at the binding or look at an illustration inside, if that's the reason that they have it. Um, I think most collectors that I know um, don't acquire an important 
book and then uh, you know put it in the in the mausoleum. They they uh, engage with them at least from time to time. Oh, okay, but they don't read them. Like they would read a book. Not, like they would read a dollar book they would get outside. They don't read them no, in that way. No, no, but that's but they, they still it's not something that they wouldn't handle or wouldn't use from time to time. But no, if they want to read I their you copy, keep using words other than read, the word read. <laughs> they handle yeah, if they, they want to well that's right. Hey, I, and I and I do because um, I in in my world and my conception of, of what a book is um, there are tons of uses for books uh, beyond reading from from page one to, to page the last. Um, but, but yeah, if somebody is going to read a book to you know to to read the text or reread the whole text, no, they're going to have a paperback copy or a a, a more uh, a more ephemeral copy of. Um, of the text to do that with. So and I would probably count as a book accumulator. See, I, I think a lot of people who think about this would probably put you in that category. I'm probably an outlier in that I wouldn't. I actually would consider your accumulation of, of books a collection. Now, when <laughs> you think about that, I, is that because the, the care chosen with the individual editions? Uh, that, that's, cer that's certainly part of it. I, I mean, we can, now might be a good time to sort of try to get me to nail down my definition of a, of a collection, um, which I'll, I'll do the best I can because it is a bit amorphous. But uh, my, my definition is pretty broad in that I just think you have to have an idea. Or you have to have a reason for why you choose the book. And it, it might not be the same reason that you keep a book as opposed to another one, but I, I think you just have to have a reason, at, at least at first. So a collection a is, is and, a bunch of books with a mind behind it. Yeah, that, that's right. And, and, and I think for most people, uh, eventually that sort of idea there there will be an idea that connects the books that they keep it might not be apparent when they start accumulating books it might change it, it might um broaden as they continue to uh to to collect books um but i think with most people who do that over time in idea or ideas that link the things together. So that's why, even though, so that's why your, um, uh, your collection, I would consider a collection. Um, As opposed to like rather the, than the two shelves of books that accumulate at Beach House. That, that, that's, that's exactly right. Okay. Which are, which are there entirely because of, if I'll say this, if they're there entirely because of convenience or happenstance. Mm -hmm. Now, if they're all, if it's a beach house in Cape Cod and they're all writings about Cape Cod, well, then you have a collection. And the, the, the demonstration, the idea of that there's a mind behind an assemblage of books and that makes it a collection. And then maybe down the line, you can sort of guess at the mind from yeah, the book. That's we yes. see, you see a very melancholy demonstration of that on a regular basis, don't you, when you get a collection like that from somebody who's now gone? I, I do, but I, um, I also don't, I don't usually, um, or I, I'll say I, I very rarely find it a melancholy experience. Uh, um, I, I find it a really experience um, because here's this person who's, you know, who may have recently died or it might have been years and years ago and yet their books their collection is is communicating something to me i i think that's a that's a nice thing well it's yes it's communicating something with you right before you break it up and send it to the four winds <laughs> <laughs> I well guess maybe it, is it the thing my, that it's communicating yeah. is, please don't kill me <laughs> <You're doing it laughs> <anyway>. <laughs> 
know how many times That's I've come across up. examples of that at the Brattle. Yeah. Where, uh, like, for instance, you got a lot of books uh, a year or two ago where the person compulsively clipped out book reviews and magazine articles and stuffed them in the books. I found so many of those yes. that I nicknamed the person the Yankee Clipper. <laughs> I, I figured they couldn't have kept the books. You wouldn't have the book and then keep it. They must have died. And here I was getting yeah. all the Although I'll, I'll tell you, Steve, people have been doing that with books for hundreds of years. You, you wouldn't believe some of the older books that I'll open up, contemporary or near contemporary, or at least quite old periodical clippings of um, you know, articles related to that book. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty old practice and, and pretty it's common. It very seldom, I mean, for, for ordinary people, for the people that Virginia yeah. Woolf called common readers, their collections are not sustained once the mind is gone behind them, right? It, a famous person, that's sure. Right. That's right. Thoreau's like, yeah, that's right. Sustained, but it, most people not. Doesn't that happen a lot? That's right. I mean, I know somebody who used to work at the housing oh, bookstore in New York, and they would get major figures, they would get the whole library. It would just be carted mm -hmm. out because the you know the heir, the daughter, the granddaughter, they don't even want to look at these things anymore. They're not going to keep them. Just take them all. Right. Mm -hmm. and in many, many of those cases, we're talking major well-known authors or Hollywood impresarios. Right. The books could not be kept together. There wouldn't have been any interest mm -hmm. in the memorial collection. So they were just right. up and scattered. Yeah. Well, I, a lot of... Um... And, and that happens for very understandable, practical reasons uh, all the time. Um, but also it, it's, it can be a very uh, interesting um, and in, engrossing practice for a collector or a profitable one for a bookseller to try and reconstruct those libraries, those collections as, as much as possible. Um, does that ever so that, does that ever or frequently increase the value of a book? Not the book itself can. or the edition, but the previous owner. Absolutely. Yes, it can. With with a lot of it, probably happens. It it happens less frequently than the people with that person's book want it to happen. You know, very. Very often, uh, and this happens a lot with uh, with scholarly books. Someone might be very important, or at least you know, a, a decently well known figure within a particular field that just has no juice with with the book collector. Um, but it, it there certainly are copies that sell just because it was a well known figure's copy of that. So, book. do they ever sell more? Like for instance, if you take if you take Richard Ellis's book on sharks, you, so you know, you take Richard Ellis's the first edition, the first printing of Richard Ellis's book on sharks, is that going to be more or less valuable than Peter Benchley's copy of Richard Ellis's book on sharks that he drew from <laughs> to make his novel? Is it, oh god, to prove that it was that it was Benchley's edition. If he had a, a name, a plate in it, or something like yep. that. If there was something. Oh my God, I'd want Benchley's. I'd sell the shit out of that. Are you that would be me? more collectible yeah. than the first edition of the book itself. I, yes? Yeah. I, I mean, there's, there's. I think, I, I think it would. Um, now, I, uh, yes, I I, in that, that case, I would, no, I, I wouldn't, I, I just wouldn't, I, I wouldn't put that down as a, um, uh, as an across the board rule. Because if you have a book that's extremely valuable, first edition, some so, some uh, person with an some important figure with an associated that text, their text, if it's not a first edition, might not you know rise to that level. But it's it's a decent uh, guideline anyway. That All it, the examples that are coming to my mind. You can connect the important person. To, yeah. Right. I, all the all the, the examples that are coming to my mind, I think all go the one way and not the other. I, I well, they were that because that's what a yeah. provable copy of the Godfather that was Marlon Brando's copy of the book would be more than the first edition of the Godfather. I feel certain. Then it, 
No, it, it would, regardless of what edition Marlin had. Um, but, you know, if uh, I'm trying to think of, of a good example of, of the other way, um, uh, who's, uh, g give me, let, let me see, who's a good, um, a good uh, American hist. Who's a good American history? Bernard. Okay, let's say um, Bernard Balin's copy of the Federalist Papers. You know, Bernard Balin's a you know a great, <laughs> a eminent American historian. But unless it's an early edition of the Federalist Papers, it's it's not going to sniff what. Uh, even so, though, if it's more valuable than that edition would normally. So when we're talking about something like that, we're just as a digression, where where a famous person has a copy of a book and that makes it collectible, is that part of the justification for what's known as presentation copies to trace that provenance? Yes, uh, pr presentation copies. So a presentation copy is, is a personal inscription from the author of the book itself. But there are also things um, called, uh, there's a whole category called association copies, which is what your hypothetical um, uh, Benchley copy would be. So the owner has an association to the text okay. itself. Okay, Is so there, are there thriving markets for both? Oh yes. I didn't even know the term association copy. Oh yes. No, it's a great, it's a great one and it, it's sort of, um, yeah, it, it's a, it's a pretty wide, uh, it can be a pretty wide umbrella, but, uh, it's, uh, it's an important one. It's important. Oh my, because no, I'm trying it, it to think links, of some presentation it links, copies. What? It links real, uh, it, it links real, uh, you know, historical figures to the object. In, what in must some be way, some of is, the most valuable presentation copies? I can, my oh mind my boggles. I mean, it, are there presentation copies between Tolstoy and Dostoevsky? To get back to your beloved Russians. <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great question. There, there probably are. Uh, there are between Tolstoy and Chekhov. Um, is, there a, is there a presentation that, that copy mean, of Moby uh, Dick to Nathaniel Hawthorne? Oh, <laughs> there must be. <laughs> there must be. Um, ah. they, they have to be, they knew, they knew each other. They, there has to be now, or, or I should say there has to have been <laughs> whether or not it's, it's known to exist at the moment. Um, it's something that certainly should exist. Okay. Or, and this brings us around higher in, likelihood than that. in a kind of way, this brings us to round to the, to one possible difference between the idea of an accumulator and a collector. Right, mm -hmm. just uh, I, for instance, if if there were a presentation copy of Moby Dick to my beloved Nathaniel <laughs> out in the sale lot for a dollar, <laughs> I would not get it. I already have <laughs> copies of Moby Dick. I, I have all the copies of Moby Dick. That I, I would just leave it there. So, yes, does it fundamentally mean well, that. I, well, I'm well, not Steve, if you if you find that will you at least alert me <laughs> well i would i would send up a flare absolutely but i wouldn't do it myself right I, it, it, well but see that in in my mind steve that makes an even stronger argument as to why your your group of books is a collection rather than an accumulation because that book doesn't fit with your criteria right. for going into your collection which means, you know, which implies that you have very definite and specific criteria. Well, that's a very diplomatic way of putting it. <laughs> yes, yes, it doesn't fit with my lonely yep. old shut-in aesthetic. <laughs> <laughs> but I, like, but, you get people who they they are interested in. I guess it's it comes down to the subject of books as objects. There are, I mean, there are right. of books or, or anything else is, is object. Right. Is, is there a reason for the physical, you know, for that particular version of the physical object or that particular physical object as opposed to another one? That, I think that's a big part of it. Sorry if you can hear the, the end of the world across the room here. Frida, what are you doing? I, is everything, everything okay, Frida? 
Can you just tell her it's me so she won't care and she'll settle down? She's just thrashing around. At one point, she looked like she was trying to do a headstand. <laughs> and it's I know why. It's because she's not next to me. She's she she I'm intentionally separate from her and she hates that. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Uh, you say you said earlier that you know plenty of collectors who interact with their books. I'm yes. still having a hard time believing that. I've known so many collectors who buy intentionally buy doubles and triples of copies so that they have books to read. Yes. Specifically and, because and they don't I, that absolutely that. and and very often will sell a, a valuable first edition uh, of a literary text and throw in a a reading copy for the uh, for the person who buys it. Uh, that's that's a relatively common practice around um, uh, among among booksellers. But my only point is, yes, they're not going to read their first edition from from cover to cover. They're going to have another version of the text for that. In in almost in most cases, uh, but that doesn't mean they never use it or they never enter. It's not a dead thing on the shelf. There are plenty of other meaningful ways to to interact with a book object. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> it's the third Don't. time you have said that. There's only one, one, only one Arabic numeral one use for a book. There's only one Arabic numeral one, only one, and only one full set use for a book. Right? There is no more than one. Mathematically speaking, there is no more than <laughs> one parenthesis number one use for a book, and that is to read it dog-earing its pages and occasionally dribbling bits of your veggie calzone in between the pages. Why a veggie calzone? <laughs> <laughs> They're delicious. <laughs> oh, I love a veggie calzone, but is it always a veggie calzone? They're pretty sloppy. Yeah. <laughs> but then again, when you when you learn how to eat food from dogs, all of your meals are sloppy. <laughs> I get food everywhere, <laughs> including in all of these books. <laughs> but the, the attitude of, of collecting that I'm thinking about can often apply to books that aren't valuable. For a while, I actually had the bug. There are little mass market paperbacks. I'm sure that you know them. They're the Magnum Easy Eye mass market paperbacks. These little white paperbacks, crappy binding, original artwork on the cover. They're all numbered. You have one in the shop right now for Jude the Obscure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and those I are, that's a great series. I once had a whole bookcase of those. I looked for them. And I wanted them only because of that series, not because I was going to read them. I had more durable mm -hmm. editions. Those things fall apart if you read them. Oh, oh yeah. Unless right. it's short. My my Magnum Easy Eye of Hamlet and my Magnum Easy Eye of the Hound of the Basketballs <laughs> have never fallen apart. But they they made one for well, uh, Michael Strogoff. Uh, to the obscure is a really long one okay. they, they i think they did one for moby dick that was sort of a holy grail oh yeah they definitely did do a moby dick. i've never seen it yeah. I, i'm years. almost certain i've seen the moby dick uh, but that kind of thing extends to people like for instance you'll get people who will want a whole bookcase of the old reader's digest classics in hardcovers with you know the original illustrations but they'll yes. use that I, I have i have seen that although that's yeah that's certainly a that would can be considered a collection. That Absolutely. that urge to you got to get them all. That's yeah, different from get them all. this. That's different from the mindset that would assemble a particular collection of books. Yeah, I mean, it's I I guess it's a different mindset. It's a different approach, but it's um, it's all under the same general um, heading of of collecting. It's just a different approach to collect. So every once in a while at the shop, you will get uh, a complete set of the Loeb Classical Library, right? Or uh, uh, yeah, I think we've gotten, or or at least all of the Latin or all of the Greek. You, and, usually, if somebody has all of the Latin, they may not have all of the Greek. If somebody has all the Greek, they definitely have all, all the Latin. And you just at least got a huge or, amount uh, of they, Library of America, right? You didn't get yeah. all, and that that collection is not complete, right? I don't believe so, no. But one could. But someone that must have accumulated a, them uh, volume by volume. Someone's collecting. Yes. Yeah. That's right. It it's a nice way to collect. It gives a, it, 
for the for the for the person who likes that aesthetic, that's a nice a nice uh, you know a couple of cases of books. True, and, Although, and great texts. They're great texts. Doesn't seem like you're getting any nibbles in the shop. <laughs> no, they they've been uh, they've been moving pretty well actually. You have to oh. remember that they started double row. Ah, okay. Uh, well, I guess in my mind, I keep thinking that the only way that I would notice they're moving is if some because I would expect that somebody would buy them all all at once. Oh no, we haven't had that, but we've had people who who pick off you know a bag's worth. But you yourself do both. You have books that are set aside from your reading library. Yes. And you yeah. add to that collection separate from adding to your reading library. That's right. So are you saying that you use both? Is I, 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 of it? You use I, both in some way? You occasionally visit oh, your collectibles? All the time. Well, so I have, I ha I have, um, a couple what I consider collectible collections. Um, and I have my sort of book reference collection. That's my books that I use uh, for, for work. Um, those are both more or less you know, permanent collections, but different. Uh, and then I have just books that I'm reading that uh, chances are I'm just going to you know, sell back to the shop. Um, for, for the next person. I'm just automatically it. thinking of collectors of other things. Mm -hmm. Just It just feels so wrong for books to be thought of that way to me. Like, like action figure collectors. Consider that if the action figure is out of its packaging, it's ruined. Oh, right. That's the word they use. Yeah, I, it's ruined. Yeah. See, I, I, I don't, yeah, I, I kind of, uh, so they're, I they're I collecting aver, something. I don't have any aversion to that to that at all, because I. They're collecting something they're never going to touch. How is yeah, that? How is that not a mental disease? Uh, <laughs> well, I don't think it's. I don't think it's necessary. I'm not saying it's never a mental disease. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you couldn't, could you? Considering some of the things you've seen. <laughs> but I, I don't think it's necessarily because you're. Okay. Yes, they're collecting the action figure that's inside the box, but there's also value if someone's if if what someone values in the packaging in the way it was presented that's part of the historical object most of the time it's discarded it's not popularly considered to be the um you know the sought after object that's the fun little action figure with the movable joints and such but some people think the whole thing is the object so the box is just as important as the, the plastic figurine to certain people. And I think that's a perfectly um, interesting, I, I actually think it's much more interesting, but I, I think that's a really interesting approach to <laughs> material history, even if that's not how the person sees it. Because, <laughs> well, think about it, Two, 200, uh, 200 years from now, um, it might be interesting for someone to know exactly how that uh, Superman action figure was was marketed and sold. And the I box might do, really it? help. I, it, it, it connects with a traumatic memory. <laughs> Once upon a time, I got <laughs> a plastic model set uh, that you assemble yourself and then you're supposed to paint it of mm -hmm. Superboy and sure. Superdog fighting a multi-headed dragon. It was a plastic set that you could get. And I thought, I don't understand these model building people, but I love Superboy and Superdog, so I'll get this and I'll see if I can understand how to put it together. And I managed to put it together. And then, you know, it had, it had instructions for how to paint it. It had a picture on the back of the packaging of what it should, should look like. So I did that. Mm -hmm. I had a friend who was so into this, just so into it. He actually <laughs> urged me not to take it out of the packaging. Don't assemble the model that you just bought. Thought, it's a model. I'm supposed to assemble it. He said, "All right, but be very careful." And then he came over one Friday for a wine at Calzones and noticed that it wasn't on the shelf. Said, "Where is it?" And I said, "Well, one of my beagles pulled it down off the shelf." And he said, "Oh no! Did you save it?" And I said, "Well, he seemed like he wanted to eat it, so I let him." And he was just, <laughs> was just absolutely horrified. I'd never. Seen, I watched him years later lose his mother to a brain aneurysm. 
And he was less horrified by that than he was by the fact that I had just let a beagle eat this model. <laughs> like, oh, a brain aneurysm. Well, I guess these things happen. <laughs> well, but but that's and but that's part of it too, because the fact that most of those get eaten by the dog or get thrown away or you know get ripped up by an eager kid. Um I think makes it all more important that a couple people are maniacal about keeping them in their original. So do you think there are people out there, book people out there who keep, who collect like bigger art books and keep them in the cellophane wrapping? Oh yeah, I've seen that. You have. Well, I, I guess have. that's true because you've got art books at the store that are still wrapped, even though they're years old. Yeah, I, I for, for books like that, I, I tend to take the uh, the cellophane off unless I see a real reason to do it. Um, if, but I understand people who don't. What can be understandable about such people? A book you're never going to touch or open. What could possibly be understandable about that? <laughs> if I get a brand new John Singer Sargent art book and I don't rip the cellophane off and open it, then when I spill my veggie calzone on it it will bounce harmlessly off the plastic <laughs> what is the fun in that <laughs> <laughs> you can just wipe it off yeah I, well no it's i i don't see the fun but i you know i don't need to i, I don't need to understand uh for the for the most part i take the approach to people are allowed to like what they what they like they're allowed to consider important what they consider appointment important as long as they're not doing damage to themselves or others and, and i when, think that more when somebody is that kind of a collector they will have a short list of things that uh, that i just referenced yeah. they're holy grails things they're looking for very particular oh. things they're looking for How i many? think most collector I, I think most collectors do i mean aren't there a few editions of certain texts that you oh yes love to walk in and see <laughs> the question that i have for you yeah. specifically involves the weird that weird twist of your brain that allows you to flawlessly remember those things without writing them down how many <laughs> holy grails for sure. customers do you have in your head even though the customers are dead <laughs> where, where you're going to encounter oh, them you're going to take them out of a box someday <laughs> well, well you don't think that well, way but you're not irish it's <laughs> more than one how come yeah, <laughs> you know you have lots of holy grail. <laughs> no, but I I do have I do have some Irish heritage as a matter of fact. Um, so maybe maybe there's a connection there. But oh yeah, no, I definitely have. See, I don't I don't have the ability to tell you how many of those I have rattling around at any one point, and I really don't have any ability to remove them when they're no longer relevant. Um, <laughs> So this yes. has happened more than once, yes, where I've set real before. books apart <laughs> that I that I that I know someone was was waiting for, only to be told by someone else um, that it is it is no longer a a, a relevant want. <laughs> Very nicely put. No longer a relevant <laughs> for what for whatever reason. Oh, not. But it's only ever one reason. <laughs> So, oh my! <laughs> no, there could, could be other. It could be that this person's just not buying those anymore, and, and I never. And I, that might be a piece of information that I have that I have somewhere else in the brain. But those two, those two functions are. You have these of, these endless files, but your ability to call them up is non-existent. You have to see it. And then yeah, when you see right. it, you'll immediately yeah. remember. You'll immediately know. Oh, this is for so and so. This is for so and so. You've done that for me over the years. Oh yeah. But if I were to ask you up front, 